Our environment. We have heard the word environment often being used on the television, in newspapers, and by people around us. Our elders tell us that the environment is not what it used to be earlier, others say that we should work in a healthy environment, and global summits involving the developed and developing countries are regularly held to discuss environmental issues. In this chapter, we shall be studying how various components in the environment interact with each other and how we impact the environment. ECO system what are its components? All organisms such as plants, animals, microorganisms and human beings as well as the physical surroundings interact with each other and maintain a balance in nature. All the interacting organisms in an area together with the non-living constituents of the environment form an ecosystem. Thus, an ecosystem consists of biotic components comprising living organisms and abiotic components comprising physical factors like temperature, rainfall, wind, soil and minerals. For example, if you visit a garden you will find different plants, such as grasses, trees, flower-bearing plants like rose, jasmine, sunflower, and animals like frogs, insects and birds. All these living organisms interact with each other, and their growth, reproduction and other acti activities are affected by the abiotic components of ecosystem. So a garden is an ecosystem. Other types of ecosystems are forests, ponds, and lakes. These are natural ecosystems while gardens and crop fields are human-made, artificial, ecosystems. We have seen in earlier classes that organisms can be grouped as producers, consumers and decomposers according to the manner in which they obtain their sustenance from the environment. Let us recall what we have learned through the self-sustaining ecosystem created by us above. Which organisms can make organic compounds like sugar and starch from inorganic substances using the radiant energy of the sun in the presence of chlorophyll? All green plants and certain bacteria which can produce food by photosynthesis come under this category and are called the producers. Organisms depend on the producers either directly or indirectly for their sustenance. These organisms which consume the food produced, either directly from producers or indirectly by feeding on other consumers are the consumers. Consumers can be classed variously as herbivores, carnivores, omnivores, and parasites. Can you give examples for each of these categories of consumers? And imagine the situation where you do not clean the aquarium and some fish and plants have died. Have you ever thought what happens when an organism dies? The microorganisms, comprising bacteria and fungi, break down the dead remains and waste products of organisms. These microorganisms are the decomposers, as they break down the complex organic substances into simple inorganic substances that go into the soil and are used, are used up once more by the plants. What will happen to the garbage and dead animals and plants in their absence? Will the natural replenishment of the soil take place, even if decomposers are not there? Food chains and webs. In activity 15.4 we have formed a series of organisms feeding on one another. This series or organisms taking part at various biotic levels form a food chain, figure 15.1. Each step or level of the food chain forms a trophic level. The autotrophs, or the producers, are at the first trophic level. They fix up the solar energy and make it available for heterotrophs, or the consumers. The herbivores, or the primary consumers, come at the second, small carnivores, or the secondary consumers at the third, and larger carnivores, or the tertiary consumers, form the fourth trophic level, figure 15.2. We know that the food we eat acts as a fuel to provide us energy to do work. Thus the interactions among various components of the environment involves flow of energy from one component of the system to another. As we have studied, the autotrophs capture the energy present in sunlight and convert it into chemical energy. This energy supports all the activities of the living world. From autotrophs, the energy goes to the heterotrophs and decomposers. However, as we saw in the previous chapter on sources of energy, when one form of energy is changed to another, some energy is lost to the environment in forms which cannot be used again. The flow of energy between various components of the environment has been extensively studied, and it has been found that, in the green plants in a terrestrial ecosystem capture about 1% of the energy of sunlight that falls on their leaves and convert it into food energy. And when green plants are eaten by primary consumers, a great deal of energy is lost as heat to the environment, some amount goes into digestion, and in doing work, and the rest goes towards growth and reproduction. An average of 10% of the food eaten is turned into its own body and made available for the next level of consumers. And therefore, 10% can be taken as the average value for the amount of organic matter that is present at each step and reaches the next level of consumers. And since so little energy is available for the next level of consumers, food chains generally consist of only three or four steps. 
The loss of energy at each step is so great that very little usable energy remains after four trophic levels. And there are generally a greater number of individuals at the lower trophic levels of an ecosystem, the greatest number is of the producers. And the length and complexity of food chains vary greatly. Each organism is generally eaten by, by two or more other kinds of organisms which in turn are eaten by several other organisms. So instead of a straight line food chain, the relationship can be shown as a series of branching lines called a food web. From the energy flow diagram, two things become clear. Firstly, the flow of energy is unidirectional. The energy that is captured by the autotrophs does not revert back to the solar input, and the energy which passes to the herbivores does not come back to autotrophs. As it moves progressively through the various trophic levels, it is no longer available to the previous level. Secondly, the energy available at each trophic level gets diminished progressively due to loss of energy at each level. Another interesting aspect of food chain is how unknowingly some harmful chemicals enter our bodies through the food chain. You have read in class 9 how water gets polluted. One of the reasons is the use of several pesticides and other chemicals to protect our crops from diseases and pests. These chemicals are either washed down into the soil or into the water bodies. From the soil, these are absorbed by the plants along with water and minerals, and from the water bodies these are taken up by aquatic plants and animals. This is one of the ways in which they enter the food chain. As these chemicals are not degradable, these get accumulated progressively at each trophic level. As human beings occupy the top level in any food chain, the maximum concentration of these chemicals get accumulated in our bodies. This phenomenon is known as biological magnification. This is the reason why our food grains such as wheat and rice, vegetables and fruits, and even meat, contain varying amounts of pesticide residues. They cannot always be removed by washing or other means. How do our activities affect the environment? We are an integral part of the environment. Changes in the environment affect us and our activities change the environment around us. We have already seen seen in class 9 how our activities pollute the environment. In this chapter, we shall be looking at two of the environmental problems in detail, that is, depletion of the ozone layer and waste disposal. Ozone layer and how it is getting depleted. Ozone, O3, is a molecule formed by three atoms of oxygen. While O2, which we normally refer to as oxygen, is essential for all aerobic forms of life. Ozone is a deadly poison. However, at the higher levels of the atmosphere, ozone performs an essential function. It shields the surface of the Earth from ultraviolet, UV, radiation from the sun. This radiation is highly damaging to organisms, for example, it is known to cause skin cancer in human beings. Ozone at the higher levels of the atmosphere is a product of UV radiation acting on oxygen, O2, molecule. The higher energy UV radiation split apart some molecular oxygen, O2, into free oxygen, O, atoms. These atoms then combine with the molecular oxygen to form ozone. The amount of ozone in the atmosphere began to drop sharply in the 1980s. This decrease has been linked to synthetic chemicals like chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, which are used as refrigerants and in fire extinguishers. In 1987, the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, succeeded in forging an agreement to freeze CFC production at 1986 levels. It is now mandatory for all the manufacturing companies to make CFC-free refrigerators throughout the world. Managing the garbage we produce In our, in our daily activities, we generate a lot of material that are thrown away. What are some of these waste materials? What happens after we throw them away? Let us perform an activity to find answers to these questions. We have seen in the chapter on life processes that the food we eat is digested by various enzymes in our body. Have you ever wondered why the same enzyme does not break down everything we eat? Enzymes are specific in their action, specific enzymes are needed for the breakdown of a particular substance. That is why we will not get any energy if we try to eat coal. Because of this, many human-made materials like plastics will not be broken down by the action of bacteria or other saprophytes. These materials will be acted upon by physical processes like heat and pressure, but under the ambient conditions found in our environment, these persist for a long time. Substances that are broken down by biological processes are said to be biodegradable. How many of the substances you buried were biodegradable? Substances that are not broken down in this manner are said to be non-biodegradable. 
These substances may be inert and simply persist in the environment for a long time or may harm the various members of the ecosystem. Visit any town or city, and we are sure to find heaps of garbage all over the place. Visit any place of tourist interest, and we are sure to find the place littered with empty food wrappers. In the earlier classes we have talked about this problem of dealing with the garbage that we generate. Let us now look at the problem a bit more deeply. Improvements in our lifestyle have resulted in greater amounts of waste material, material generation. Changes in attitude also have a role to play, with more and more things we use becoming disposable. Changes in packaging have resulted in much of our waste becoming non-biodegradable. What do you think will be the impact of these on our environment? Disposable cups and trains. If you ask your parents, they will probably remember a time when tea and trains was served in plastic glasses which had to be returned to the vendor. The introduction of disposable cups was hailed as a step forward for reasons of hygiene. No one at that time perhaps thought about the impact caused by the disposal of millions of these cups on a daily basis. Some time back, culhads, that is, disposable cups made of clay, were suggested as an alternative. But a little thought showed that making these culhads on a large scale would result in the loss of the fertile topsoil. Now disposable paper cups are being used. What do you think are the advantages of disposable paper cups over disposable plastic cups?